Okay, so this lecture is basically about what has been happening in the last nine months and stuff that we've talked about a little bit before. But really the, the notion is that America has an operating system that may need to be rebooted. So uh, as some of you know, I have a blog. And about a year ago, I wrote that I had a sense of dread that there was a profound economic peril. We have lived as a country off the rich inheritance of past generations, and now the party may be coming to a close. Last month, Nouriel Roubini, who is a professor at NYU, basically wrote that we now have a housing bubble, a mortgage bubble, an equity bubble, a bond bubble, a credit bubble, a commodity bubble, a private equity bubble, a hedge fund bubble, and it's all bursting at once. And that's essentially what happened here. Now, any of you who follow the stock market or have portfolios, I don't need to tell you that the last year has been one of the worst years in the history of the stock market. It's, in fact, it is the worst year since 1932. But what is also bad and is masked by the official statistics of unemployment, which says that we have only 6.5% unemployment, is what is called the hidden unemployment. And that is people who are working part time and would like to work full time. And so when you total that up, the real unemployment rate is closer to 11%. Now, the conventional wisdom that is that the crash that we're suffering is all caused essentially by the housing bubble. But I want to say that I don't think that that is really true. And that this chart, which is a chart of household financial liabilities to disposable income, in other words, how much you earn compared to how much you owe, has in the last 50 years gotten completely out of whack. And that this is the basic problem that we suffer. In other words, that we have essentially go on from 40% to 160%. And that was unsustainable. So what will result now as we unwind that leverage is basically overcapacity. And we will find ourselves with empty malls and hollowed out factories. And that's the problem that we're going to have to confound, confront over the next few years. Now, I talked about America 3.0, but first I need to give you an idea what I meant by America 1.0 and America 2.0. So America 1.0 is really the vision of Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the other part of this was George Washington's famous final speech, which said it will be our policy to cultivate tranquility at home and abroad and extend our commerce as far as possible. In other words, that this would be a country that was basically a commercial power, but not a military imperialistic power. That we would want to have tranquility everywhere, but at least do business with everyone. America 2.0 really took place when President Wilson decided that we should make the world safe for democracy. And this then changed our position with the rest of the world. And obviously, that position became a much more military position in terms of our entrance into World War I, our entrance into World War II, and the successive wars that we have fought ever since then. And that really went from 1917 to 1980, at which point Ronald Reagan was elected. And I call this America 2.5 because this was essentially the conservative counter-revolution. And it had front men like Reagan, Rush Limbaugh, Newt Gingrich, but it also had intellectual progenitors like Irving Kristol, who basically said that the twin poles of neoconservatism that he had laid out were two. One, that in domestic affairs, the national government should shrink 
by cutting taxes and business regulations. And in foreign affairs, the government should grow by becoming the world's sole military superpower. Now, this idea was backed by some very strong foundations in Washington, the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation. And the notion that this kind of discontinuity where you would be cutting taxes radically, but growing a much bigger military, and that those two things might be in conflict, didn't seem to um, make any difference to the neoconservatives. Now this, of course, has become, I would argue, part of our undoing. This philosophy reached its total progenitor in, in the Bush preemptive wars and tax cuts. Um, the Quadrennial Defense Review called it the long war, meaning that we would be in an unending war with terrorists. And as you can see by the chart, the people who were making more than 10 million took almost all of the tax cuts that were given um, by the Bush regime. This, needless to say, this combination of large military budgets and large tax cuts led to this incredible situation where the total credit market debt as a percentage of US GDP rose to heights that went beyond the heights that they were in 1929, just before the crash. And in fact, our total debt is above 44 trillion. Um, so we are in an unprecedented situation. And in that sense, we reached a place where there was a break. Now, this break we've talked about before, which is really the ideas of Joseph Schumpeter, which is the idea of creative destruction. And we've seen creative destruction in companies. Certainly General Motors is undergoing that right now, but it also happens in countries where essentially you have inability to create new ideas and to innovate causes both companies and in some ways governments to fall. So this has led me to use the term interregnum, that we are in an interregnum and Gramsci said, the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, there arises a great diversity of morbid symptoms. And we are essentially experiencing some of these morbid symptoms right now. In other words, the old idea of neoconservative economics has failed us, but we do not yet have a way to figure out how to get out of it. Now, the term interregnum comes from the English Civil War in which in 1649, Charles I had his head chopped off and Cromwell began a 12-year rule that was a, the first parliamentary quasi-democracy in uh, Great Britain only to be ended when Charles II was restored to the throne. But I think of the interregnum in a much more metaphorical sense, and I would compare it to the end of the British Empire in 1901 when Queen Victoria died. This is her funeral train, and as you can notice, it is drawn by horses. Uh, there were no moving pictures of this event. Uh, and behind her carriage, bearing her body are the crown princes of Europe. There were three emperors, two kings, 46 archdukes, and these people who basically ruled over Europe had more than half the world's citizens paying allegiance to them. In other words, the European feudal powers controlled a good part of the world. And needless to say, it was said that the sun never set on the English empire. But at the very moment when this was happening, 
Marconi was raising a, the first wireless uh, station in southern England that would send radio signals across the Atlantic. Uh, Albert Einstein was filing his first paper on the unified field theory. Uh, Freud was publishing his first book on the unconscious. Certainly the Wright brothers and Henry Ford were tinkering in their garages. So there was this unobserved technological revolution going on at the very time when the rulers of Europe thought that nothing could change. And so this to me was a true interregnum in the sense that the people who were walking behind Queen Victoria's casket had not a clue that this technological revolution was happening. So I have talked a little bit about this before, but we are in another revolution. And that revolution is basically whether the sources of leadership, innovation, and change will come from decentralized, networked, bottom-up forces, or come from centralized, hierarchical, top-down forces. And this other axis of this chart says, will the global economic and cultural influence of the US decrease or increase? And given what you believe about this, it gives you four different pictures of what the world would look like in the next 20 years. And most of the futurists that I work with believe that at least we will be in the bottom half of this matrix that the de decentralized network bottom-up forces of companies like Google will dominate the centralized hierarchical top-down forces of companies like Microsoft. Now, I don't need to tell any of you who've spent time at the London School of Economics or anything else that empires always end. And if you spend time in London, you know that empires end, and this is needless to say, the, the final decadent end of the Roman Empire, and people study that all the time. But needless to say, the English Empire also ended. But I would argue that it ended in a way that was not uncomfortable for the English people, that they were able to go on in their lives and do quite well, and uh, it didn't really matter. But those people who analyze empires and their end have come to the conclusion that there are basically four things that are signposts of the end of empire. One is called imperial overstretch. One is called cultural decline. One is accelerated inequality. And one is scientific regression. And I'll go through each of those. So imperial overstretch basically means that a country extends itself imperially farther than it ought to. And this graph of our federal discretionary budget for the year 2007 shows that the national defense takes up 56% of the budget and that everything else is squeezed into small increments and literally health care takes up 6% of the budget, uh, education takes up 4%. And as Joe Stieglitz, who was world, the economist for the uh, World Bank, said, we could have spent $2 trillion on the war much better ways and left us with more security. Now, the second problem with that is, is what game theorists call the free rider problem. And when you look at the comparative military spending of all our commercial rivals, you can see that the US military spending is so outrageously bigger than anybody else that essentially all of our rivals can afford to spend money on national health care, on infrastructure, on many other things to build their own economies because we will make sure that the Straits of Hormuz stay open. We will make sure that there are soldiers in Korea and all sorts of other places. And they, needless to say, don't pay us any money for this service. We give it to it for free. But unlike the English in their imperial era of the late 19th century, we don't get 
the assets of the countries that we control any cheaper. In other words, we pay the exact same dollar per barrel of oil as the Japanese traders do or as the Chinese do or anybody else. So we get no advantage for spending 700 billion uh, a year on our military and in fact we pay out to the Gulf states, to Russia, to Venezuela, essentially 700 billion more for oil to bring it into the United States. And this, needless to say, leads us to these um, incredible deficits because we are borrowing that money mostly from the Chinese, from the Japanese, from the Koreans. And as this cartoon shows, President Bush saying, while well, President Hu is out front with his Chinese van full of US Treasury bills, everybody straighten up the landlords here. So the reason we need to borrow all this money from the Chinese, of course, is that we as a country don't save anything. In fact, as you can see, the personal savings rate for the United States dropped below zero in 2005 and has never come back. So that means that the average US citizen spends more than they earn every year. Now, the second sign of decline is scientific regression. And if you go outside of Louisville, Kentucky, you can go to the Creation Museum where you will see that dinosaurs and humans walked together on Earth 5,000 years ago, and you will have all the proof you need that evolution couldn't possibly be true. But it's not just that kind of stupidity that we have to deal with, because essentially, as you can see, these are the 12th grade science scores, and the US ranks, depending on who's doing the counting, somewhere between 22nd and 28th in the world in 12th grade science scores. So that basically our ability to teach people about the future and about science is equally uh, defeated. In healthcare, we rank 23rd in infant mortality, 20th in life expectancy for women, 21st for men. And as you notice, we were once first in many of these categories uh, and have fallen radically, and yet we spend more than 40% more per capita on health care than any other industrialized country. And we also have been a leader in neglecting the idea of global warming. In fact, by refusing to sign the Kyoto Treaty, we have really dragged the whole world down in that sense. And of course, as you can see, the, the polar ice cap is shrinking radically. This is the Amazon River at one point, and the polar bears are having a hard time with their habitat, and the glaciers are shrinking. Now, because we have neglected this notion of energy efficiency, we are ranked 28th in the world in energy efficiency behind Bangladesh, Greece, and all sorts of other places, and it's really uh, this huge gap that we're going to have to make up in the next few years. And also because our, our policy on energy has really been driven by auto manufacturers who are much more interested in making large trucks that get 12 miles to the gallon than they were in creating cars that were energy efficient, we all of a sudden find ourselves with two of the three American auto manufacturers about to go bankrupt because they make cars that nobody wants. And that has been uh, a pattern. And because also we are so dependent on foreign oil, we take it that we have to fight wars for oil. And uh, Alan Greenspan noted very clearly that even though nobody wants to talk about it, the Iraq war was a war for oil. And it cannot be denied. And because we fight wars in Iraq, needless to say, in Islamabad, when they get pissed off at the Americans, the first thing they do is burn down the KFC or the McDonald's. And so if you're an American company, you have more and more problems that you're faced with when you try to project your brand America abroad. 
The third sign of decline is, is a cultural. And John Galbraith basically said that uh, it cannot be assumed that the welfare is greater at an all around higher level of production than in a lower one. The higher level of production has merely a higher level of want creation, necessitating a higher level of want satisfaction. Now, these are signs of the higher level of want creation. Our ability to embed advertising everywhere you go. So you ride in the taxi and there's a TV and you lie down on the doctor's uh, bed and there's advertisements on that. You, you go in the subways and there's advertising. And, and Galbraith basically said the average member of the middle class is like a gerbil on a treadmill. He's trying to get ahead of his peers, but he's not making any progress. But there are people who are not on that treadmill. And in fact, they are so disconnected that we don't really have any way of even measuring it. 72% of uh, black male high school dropouts are unemployed. Uh, you know, 17% of the homeless are between the ages of 22 and 30. These are not old people, these are young people who are homeless. Now, we have seen this disconnection in other countries before. We've seen in the banlieues of Paris where the Arab kids burn cars every Friday night, or we can see in Rio where these favelas, these cardboard shacks sit right up against high-rise um, condominiums for the rich. And we have even seen it in our own country during Katrina where we peeled back the layers of the onion and we saw that there were people so poor they could not afford a bus ticket to get out of town before the hurricane hit. And also we've seen it in the sense that our gun deaths are way off the chart from any other society. Uh, 81 people a day die from gunshot wounds and this statistic kind of shocked me that 25 people over 40 kill themselves uh, every day with a gun. Now, all of this underground, disconnected activity creates a complete economy, and it's quite a large economy. It's $650 billion a year, uh, according to the FBI, and that's basically drug money, prostitution, uh, illegal labor, you know, day labor, and many other things that are basically criminally uh, oriented. And as the CIA has seen that we are by far the largest consumer of cocaine and methamphetamine that leads to results like this. And one of the kind of weird statistics that they chart is 100 bills is a share of US currency. Now, a $100 bill is really only good if you're a drug dealer or if you're paying day laborers or, or you're doing underground activities. And as you can see, $100 bills are almost 70% of all currency now when it used to be 20%. So this is a clear sign that we are, we're living in an underground economy. Now, Aldous Huxley, who was one of my favorite writers, kind of foresaw all of this. He wrote a book called Brave New World in which he, he basically argued that the future would not be the future of George Orwell's boot uh, and Big Brother stepping on you, but really would be a future in which the government would hand out uh, a pill called Soma that you would take every day and it was a kind of combination Prozac and Viagra and you'd kind of have this general sense of well-being and you'd go to the feelies and those were movies but they would have extra effects and you would you would just kind of absorb yourself in entertainment and you would be so absorbed in fact that you would not even know or care what the government was doing and there was always a war going on somewhere you never knew anybody who was in the war but the war was the excuse for the government to keep control of the society and this book written in 1933 is perhaps the darker vision of our dystopian world to come. 
I would argue that we are living in a world of bread and circuses uh, where a president can pretend to be a fighter jock, where uh, a guy like Sanjay can pretend to be a singer, or uh, Donald Trump can pretend to be a great businessman even though he's gone bankrupt three times, where you can buy a bling bling Barbie, uh, you know, hooker doll for your kids, just like Paris Hilton. Um, and, and that's kind of a dark vision as well. Which leads us to the fourth sign of decline, which is this notion of accelerating inequality, which comes without the government's ability to regulate the society and its financial instruments. So this is a, a chart which marks productivity against median family income. It has always been a basis of capitalism that productivity and income should rise in concert with each other. Because basically, as workers work harder and put more output, they should get some of the benefits of that. But the problem is that starting in 2000, these two things went completely in different directions. Now, partially that's because we were able to outsource a huge amount of work to lower wage countries, and so none of that benefit accrued to US workers. But partially it also came about because when I put you to work for my company and I hand you a Blackberry as part of your job, I really can get you to work 12 to 14 hours a day while I pay you eight hours a day um, because you are always on uh, my beck and call. Now, Alan Blinder, who was vice chairman of the Fed, says that this outsourcing phenomena is only beginning and that maybe as many as 50 million more jobs could be outsourced. And they're not just jobs that have to do with back office work or software development, but they're really jobs that we always thought were really primary service jobs that couldn't be outsourced. In other words, that you, you, you go to HR block to get your taxes done, but they send it to Ireland electronically. You go to your doctor to get an x-ray, but that x-ray gets electronically sent to India for reading overnight. So that notion of the service economy being, being outsourced is also rather frightening. Now, the outcome of this is that when for the history of the US post-World War II was that basically the median family income would grow better than the income for the top one-tenth of one percent. And then in 1980, with the election of Ronald Reagan and the implosion of neoconservative economics, that began to go out of whack. And as you can see, during the Bush administration, the top one-tenth of one percent took most of the income gains while the median family income just stayed flat. Now, why was this allowed to go on? Well, for one thing, the average middle class family was benefiting from the rise in home values. And how are they benefiting? Well, you notice that these two charts tend to track each other. And this is what is called home equity instruction. And basically what happened was as your home value went up, you borrowed the money. So you were extracting all that money, but needless to say, when home values plunged, you weren't able to extract that money anymore. So the ability to live beyond your means all of a sudden became impossible. Now, I trace the real crash to a fatal move in June of 2004 when the SEC decided to deregulate the banks. And essentially what they did was they let the broker dealers, that is the Goldman Sachs, the Lehman Brothers, the Bear Stearns, the Merrill Lynch's, compute their net capital. In other words, instead of saying, as a bank, you have to have a dollar of reserves for every $10 you loan. They said, 
you can use alternative methods to create, compute how much money you can loan. And when Bear Stearns crashed, it, was it had $37 of loans out for every dollar of capital it had. It was just out of control because they decided not to regulate the banks. Now, Bill Gross, who is probably the greatest investor and certainly controls the largest bond pro portfolio in the world, calls this the Bank of Shadows. This is the Bank of Jimmy Stewart, the one that you always remember from the, from the movies, where the bank had nice, heavy reserves and then it could loan above it. But the Bank of Shadows has very little reserves. And so when the Bank of Shadows began to get a run on it, it had no cushion. And needless to say, you can see banks like First Houston or National City Bank, Fifth Third, just crashing. And even once we got rid of worrying about the mortgage debt, we also have to acknowledge that our consumer debt, that is just the amount of credit card debt we owe, has also skyrocketed. And so that is probably the next shoe to fall. But more extraordinary was this notion of derivatives. And this is a chart of the outstanding credit default swaps that went from, you can see, about 1 billion to 40 trillion, 40 trillion, on top of collateral that was less than 2 trillion. Now, this seems almost impossible, but as Warren Buffett said, derivatives are like hell, easy to enter, and almost impossible to exit. And that is essentially where we are now. Now, I believe that in order to get out of this place, we need to have a new operating system. And that's what I call America 3.0. And that government technology and innovation can get us out of this problem. Now, my assumptions are that by the day that President Obama takes office, unemployment will be close to 8% that the Christmas retail season will have been the worst in 25 years, that there will be many more retail bankruptcies past Circuit City, past linens and things, and all these other ones that are gone out of business already, that more banks will have failed, three failed over the weekend, um, that states and mun municipalities will still have big problems accessing the credit markets, and that personal credit card defaults and bankruptcies will have come climbed even further than they have already. But there is hope. We have tools for this recovery. And the tools are ones that we have discussed in this classroom a lot, such as Moore's Law. Um, one of the things I want to point to is that this is the 50th anniversary of DARPA. DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. And DARPA was essentially the government's vehicle to create the internet. It was government money, starting in 1958, that created the networked computer and the internet. And what I'm suggesting is that the government is going to have to be the engine of the new innovative economy. Now, we are lucky that we have already built an extraordinary network. We are lucky that today, as opposed to 1958, we actually understand Moore's Law, that the processor speed will double every 24 months. And I would argue that that Moore's Law almost one-to-one -one applies to things like photovoltaic cells. In other words, that the output, the power of a photovoltaic cell of a certain circumference size will double every 24 months. And so that the same kind of acceleration curve that we see in computers will also apply to things like solar power. John Seely Brown, who is an advisor to the provost of USC and who was the uh, director of Xerox PARC, where 
uh, the graphic user interface, the Ethernet, and most of the great innovations in the computer revolution says all innovations happen at the edge. And what he really means is that in universities like this is where this new world will take place. Now, one of the cool things about the United States and the way the federal system is set up is that innovation can happen at individual states. Uh, Justice Brandeis said it is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. Now, California has done this in many ways. I mean, just one of the ways is we passed a clean car law four years ago that radically changed the standards for automobiles. Now, the Bush administration and the automobile manufacturers have been fighting us for years on that in courts, but my sense is that Obama will let this law go through and stop fighting it, and that will be a sea change, because needless to say, no car company can stop selling into California. They're gonna have to sell here. And so we will set the standards, and we will set the standards for appliances and many other things, just in the same way that we created our own stem cell research laws when the federal government blocked stem cell research. So what I want you to do is imagine what the world could be like in 2020, a world that was a US that was energy independent, that had universal health care, that had a radically reduced carbon footprint, that had a highly educated public, and that had a very multilateral foreign policy. So Bill Gross, who I cited before, has said, to provide a stable recovery path, government spending needs to fill the gap, not consumption. In other words, this will not be a recovery built on getting people back to the mall, but will be a recovery built on badly needed infrastructure repairs, as well as spending a lot of money on research and development projects at universities like this. That that's where the change will come, because we will make the changes by rebuilding our country. Now, R&D plus infrastructure, what would that look like? Well, my sense is the Chinese just announced that they're gonna spend 700 billion in the next year and a half on infrastructure. That's approximately 5% of their GDP. So if we, we, we would have to spend at least 500 billion a year over two years, or you know, a, a close to a trillion in two years. Um, and that would be funding things like this thin film solar film, or universal broadband, or brand new ways of organizing and building classrooms for schools so that they're schools of the 21st century, not schools of the 19th century. So the question is, well, how do we pay for all this? So for one thing, Tom Friedman has suggested that a freedom energy tax would be the quickest way to bring the cost of carbon up so that these new technologies like solar, wind, geothermal could compete. So that freedom energy tax would raise about 146 billion a year in gas taxes, another 170 billion a year in other carbon taxes on coal and other uh, natural gas. 90% of it could flow to the states and another 10% could sit in a central alternative energy R&D fund. Um, to, because gas taxes would raise, you could cut payroll taxes on people who earn less than 40K, and you would essentially restore uh, the taxes to the way they were um, during the Clinton era. But taxes alone won't be the secret, because we're still going to have to borrow money. And one of the things that Keynes has taught us is you need to, you need to make fiscal stimulus and running a deficit in a depression is okay. And, and this proves that we actually, the US government, can borrow money cheaper than anybody in the world. And actually, it's getting cheaper all the time. Now, this is one of the problems in the sense that 
people want to buy U.S. Treasury bills because they're safe compared to any other investment. But it does mean that it's incredibly cheap for the U.S. government to borrow money. In fact, you're almost paying the government to take your money if you want a, a three-month Treasury bill. So what will we do with this large amount of money, whether it's 500 billion a year, a trillion over two years? Well, the first thing we would do would be to take the federal lands that are sitting out in California and Nevada and everything and fill them with solar farms. Gigantic amounts of solar energy. We'd have to build a smart electricity grid to get that electricity from the southwest to the rest of the country. And Boone Pickens has suggested that there is a very high wind corridor in the, Ameri in the American central part of the country from Texas all the way up to the Canadian border that should be filled with wind farms. And that too would need a smart grid to get the, the electricity to where it is needed. And what would we do with this electricity? Well, one of the things we do is we'd run our cars off electricity. This is an experiment that Google did for the last year in which they retrofitted a bunch of Toyota Priuses to be plug-in hybrids, and they retrofitted a bunch of Ford Escapes to be plug-in hybrids. And they, they found over the course of a year that they could get 93 miles per gallon in a plug-in hybrid. So if you could get 93 miles per gallon compared to the 20 miles per gallon for a Toyota Sienna, that is such a radical change and would reduce our energy uses amazingly. We also, as Stuart Brand has pointed out, need to understand that nuclear power will be part of this equation because first, it does not put out carbon dioxide, so it doesn't contribute to global warming. And as this plant in France shows, the French have run 72% of their electricity grid on nuclear for 35 years without a single accident. <coughs> there will be issues about where you put the waste, but the French have solved that. And needless to say, some people are saying that the waste can be recycled in ways. So this is one of the issues we're going to have to look at. Another thing we would need, which a lot of countries have already adopted, is high-speed electric trains. One of the real problems in the United States is that there is an incredibly congested computer, commuter airline system. Uh, more than half the flights flying out of LAX are only going less than two hours. Well, that's nonsense. A train as fast as French TGV could get to San Francisco in two hours, city center to city center, on an electric train with very minimal pollution. And there are at least six other rail corridors, obviously the Boston to Washington being one, but the Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland being another one. And, and there's a bunch of them that where we could relieve most of the congestion in commuter airlines and have a non-polluting um, solution. Universal broadband. I, I've talked about this woman works for JetBlue Airlines, and she works a four-hour shift in her home. JetBlue supplies her with a high-speed modem and a computer, and she does her work from her home. And instead of sending their call centers to India or someplace else, they distribute them in people's homes around the country. And that kind of telecommuting would be an incredible boon to the society. Because first place, she doesn't have to get on the road to drive anywhere to go to her work. She doesn't have to pay for childcare because her kid can stay home. And it is a, a wonderful supplemental income. We need to rebuild our bridges and highways. As most of you know, there was, in the 1930s, during the Depression, a huge building boom. Bridges, buildings, all sorts of things. But those, those are, you know, 80 years old. And some of them are, as we saw in Minneapolis last year, falling apart. And there's probably a lot of them falling apart. And that's one of the things you can do to put people back to work very quickly. 
then we would have to pay our teachers a decent wage. In Korea, a high school teacher makes 2.5 times the average income. In the United States, a high school teacher makes 1.2 times the average income. In other words, teachers are totally underpaid in America and we have to change that. And by changing that, we also need to cut down the classroom size. So we need to hire more teachers and pay them better. And in terms of health care, if we created a universal health care system, we could eliminate 98 billion a year in ex excess administrative costs because essentially the insurance companies are spending 98 billion to market to you and then you're paying them for their things to market to you. And McKinsey also estimated that 66 billion a year in excess drug costs compared to any other country. So finally, the key to getting out of this will be for the US to become the world leader in both ET, energy technology, and IT, information technology. I think it's totally doable, and it is my hope that with the impetus of a crisis that the Obama administration can take this on and get it passed and make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.